you guys have a really unique way of not only selecting the TFOs, but putting them through the training process. I think it'd be a good time to kind of talk through that. What does the, the TFO selection process look like and, and how do you be, how do you get there? For me, it starts with recruitment, recruitment from within. There's no better, there's no better person or officer that knows how hard this job is than our own people. So I encourage our own guys to recruit who they know out there on patrol personally that they think would be a, a suitable candidate or be able to meet the standards that we set. The, um, uh, these TFOs here won't throw out names lightly. You know, they don't want to, uh, their word means a lot and, and their recommendations they don't throw lightly. So, um, uh, they, I, I expect them to recruit within and uh, find out people who would be interested in the in the in the, in the position. Um, once a year, I hold a TFO seminar within our department. I'll advertise. I'll send in charge twenty one geographic divisions, actually twenty two metro being the twenty second division. And I ask our, our uh, department social media to advertise it. I ask our league to advertise it, and I usually average over a hundred attendees to these seminars. And then we'll have interviews. Uh, Shortly after a uh, an advertisement, I try to time the uh, seminar in conjunction with an exp- uh, request to advertise for a position or vacancies, and then we'll we'll have interviews. Go back real quick to the to the seminar. What what do you guys discuss at, at the seminar? I talk about uh, the TFO selection process from start to finish. Um, okay. A little bit of how to prepare, uh, the expectations, then what they can expect from the instruction, and what we expect from them as far as preparation. And the requirements, obviously, and which are very minimal. The, your, your requirements five years on the job with, uh, at least three years recent patrol experience. So it's, it's not that much, but I think the seminar does its job of venting those who aren't really serious because I'll average over a hundred at the seminar and we average anywhere from 45 to 50 apply. So about 50% or more went to that seminar saying, I'm not ready for that because what we have on our department is called a job opportunity list that comes out for jobs on the department. And what they see at air support is air support with a bonus pay with five years requirement. That's it. And uh, the seminar is supposed to either vet or inform them of what they need and what they need to do and what's expected. And it, it vets out those who aren't really serious or haven't done any of the prepping at all. So it, it does, it's effective. And then we'll identify those in the outstanding pool based on the interview and um, package review. From the outstanding pool, those identified in the outstanding pool, which we usually average anywhere from 10 to 15 out of that 40 to 45. Everybody on the outstanding pool will have a loan with us. And uh, once I identify those in the outstanding pool, I do a, a loan prep class with them. Oh, it's not mandatory, uh, but they always all come. And I'll go over them, um, how to prepare for their loan, what to expect, and uh, what they need to know. Can, sure, can you ahead. describe what the what the loan is, real quick? Oh yeah, the, the so the loan is if you I'm gonna use myself as an example. When I was at Rampart Division, I was a senior lead officer, meaning I was uh, I had two stripes plus a star, meaning uh, I was I, I had a good job. I was a senior lead. I the pay came with it. The rank the pay came with the rank, and I was loaned to air support. Basically, for like, I, I like to see it as an extension of your interview process, a uh, practical application. Let's see if you could do everything you said in your interview as based on your tactical insight, your recommendation, command presence, your experience, things like that. So, and your preparation of navigation. So they come up on a loan and during that two month loan, it be, it can be uh, discontinued at any time. You're not guaranteed a two month loan, but in that two month loan, we're, uh, we're baby stepping. With, uh, we're having you work a certain area, navigation drills, um, accuracy, and then working the call to communication, tactical insight, and suggestions, recommendations, and things like that. And during that whole loan process, you're evalu- evaluated every single day. And if you're progressing and you're passing certain phases we set for week one, week two, week three, week four, all the way to the week eight, we'll transfer you into the division, meaning you are part of us now you you you've got the spot and you continue on with four additional months of training but during that loan if you're not meeting the standard or you're not progressing and you're hitting a brick wall it's documented where it's debriefed 
there's no surprises. There's no, uh, no, uh, I didn't know that I was doing bad. The evals can be pretty brutal. As instructors, we understand positive reinforcement, but it does me no good to tell somebody that good job, good job, good job when we really want to focus on your deficiencies so we can keep you so we can work on them. Mm -hmm. So they can be a kick in the butt sometimes, but it's, it, it's only fair to them to know exactly where they are. So when it, it, it doesn't go their way, they understand and they're on board with the decision as well. We encourage them by telling them everything they need to work on and they have an opportunity to try it again on the next go around. The one we just endorsed to be transferred in is a second time go around and it's much better on the second go around because now he knew what to expect. Now he's mm -hmm. been in the front seat. He's been over pursued. He set a perimeter. Uh, everything just came natural to him now this time out second. So it's, it's not uncommon to do a second go around. So that's what the one month loan is. So those who are on the outstanding pool, I'll do a, I call them once a month just to see where they're at. And it's a pool. They're no, nobody, like I was, I was number one in my group. So I didn't have a choice. You're coming up next month. Now we do it in a pool, which I like a lot better because if you're not ready, mentally personally you're wasting everyone's time so those who are ready send me in coach right now i'll take you guys first those who might be going through a move have scheduled paid vacation having a baby maybe going through a divorce your mind is somewhere else and your mind's not going to be here you're not going to give us 100 percent. it's probably going to fail and you you just so i like doing it that way so i take the assessments and i'll take the ones who are ready to go and the other ones they can you know you have time if you have things you have to work out, you have time. So we'll do the self, I'll do self assessments. And then the ones selected to come up on a loan, I'll have them come in and meet me with me one on one for any alibis, any last minute questions. I'll go over the whole month with them, their call signs so they can practice at home. Um, I'll show them a, an evaluation, what they're going to be looking at, uh, the phases they need to be at. I give them a list of equipment to bring with them. You know, it's, it sounds silly and I laugh because, uh, I have to tell them, don't forget your badge. Don't forget your nameplate. Don't forget your gun. <laughs> don't forget your map book, you know, stuff like that. So I just, and this is all in the experience of, you know, people showing up. They're nervous that Sunday before, that Sunday night before, probably not getting any sleep and I don't want them to forget anything. So I, I meet with them one on one. And while we're here, I put them in the system and I'll say, Hey, do you want to do a drill or two? And I kind of get a feel of where they're at. Uh, and then, uh, if they come in on the four, if, if they're endorsed to be transferred in, they, uh, continue on with four months of training. We take them out of that area. They've been working for two months. We put them in the Valley. Now the Valley, if anybody knows uh, the Los Angeles area, downtown LA and the South Central, you got a number of landmarks, a number of landmarks. San Fernando Valley is basically flat and you have to know your streets because that's all you got to rely on. <laughs> you know, major streets, some airports, some railroad tracks, and that's about it. Otherwise you have to look out the window. So there's a lot, it's a different, different, uh, different area, but you got to get used to that. You got to, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So we throw them in the valley and then that's, that's the third month. Their fourth and fifth month, they go to nights. So it's like starting all over again. You're, yeah. Everything you learned about landmarks and you know are gone. So you have to right. do, learn a new way of navigating. Now you have a, uh, a night sun controller, hand controller on your lap, and you have the flirt controller on your lap. You're working with a lip light to try to look at your map book and look out the window and direct your pilot. Now you're trying to find that spotlight in your binos while you're doing orbits and you're trying to work the infrared and you know, all that stuff. So it, it, it's almost like a, a going back to day one. So they'll do the two months at night. And then the sixth and final months, I like to call their enhancement month. Uh, they come back to day watch where I can take a last look at them. Being a full-fledged TFO, they're expected to be able to work special flights, work the tower, grab the fuel truck, safety factors like how to put wheels on a helicopter, move it around. Uh, they go through our PRISM safety program. They, it's like being a senior in high school. You're doing all that last minute stuff. And, uh, there's a sign off on each training cycle. And, uh, then we have their wing ceremony. Wow. Have you ever been to one of our wing ceremony? No, but so one of the guys I work with, Derek Alatori, you know, his dad yes, worked for you guys. Absolutely. Another and one of my mentors. When, yeah. Amazing man. And Derek is too. Derek is awesome. Uh, when, when he finished his, his training program to become a pilot, we did a wing ceremony for him. And basically we took what your traditions were and brought it to our department and used that same tradition, which is really, really cool. 
1998 was the last one that he did this. My, I, and I was going to get into this later. I met my wife here and she was here okay. before me. So she got to do this. Whether you're a pilot or a TFO, you went on your final check ride with the chief pilot or the chief TFO. And when you landed, your brothers and sister pulled you out of the helicopter. You were handcuffed to the uh, train units <laughs> in the center of the flight deck. And you were plummeted whatever whatever your uh, brothers and sisters brought that day, whether it be <laughs> um, tomatoes, eggs, milk, you know, anything. You know. And then the fire department would fly over our flight deck and dump water on you. And that was your week for a month. <laughs> Well, yeah, it wasn't know, that one. <laughs> so that fell into hazy, and uh, so we uh, we changed it up. Where I, what you're familiar with now, after you, your final check ride with the pilot, chief pilot, chief TFO, you land. Your your family's there, your friends are there. The captain gets up to a podium, talks about how bitching you are and all the struggles and and hardship you went through, and then a family member pins your wings when we do a high speed flyby. I love that. It's great. I got to do it yeah. twice as a tier, once as a TFO, once as a pilot, but I would have really liked that water drop. I think that would have been really <laughs> cool. <laughs> and so I didn't get to do the water drop. My wife got to do the water drop as a TFO, and then she uh, did the family thing when she made pilot. That's cool. We'll have to bring your wife back on, bring her on the podcast to talk about all those things oh, at, she's at a some talker. point. Yeah, she's a, she's a good <laughs> talker. Much better than me. <laughs> but uh you know what i liked about the wings ceremony was when i think back on my time as a tfo going through the training process and then as a pilot doing the same thing both times you finish training it's kind of anticlimactic like oh congratulations here now here go you're in the you're in the pool with everyone else you know, go swim it felt like like for me when i think back on uh, pilot training that was probably the hardest thing i ever did and you know i went to college and all these different things and so to finish having completed this thing, it was really, really challenging. And then to really have no finality to it was really weird. So I love that you guys do that. I think it's a great program. I think it's it speaks to what a challenge it is to complete either one of those programs. It is life-changing. People who come here, and I'm not, I, I know other agencies are different. People who come here don't leave here. It, this is a life-changing job. And to your, uh, to your statement of one of the hardest things, I've had LAPD officers who are SEAL team members, recon, uh, special forces, SWAT officers who failed and said, that's one of the hardest things I ever did. And I'm like, yeah. what? You know, but it, yeah. it's, it's challenging. And I think, don't get me wrong. I, I, I do think it's a hard job, but I also think it's self imploding A lot of guys will put a lot of pressure on themselves. I think uh, one of the failure rates or f- reasons why officers would fail out of our program is they try to be a TFO. They're trying to be that guy who's they hear on the radio where we want you to be that street cop that we always heard you on the radio, but now you're trying. And I don't know what you just said, but it made no sense at all. And you're, <laughs> you're navigating, you're inverting it, just a number of reasons in that we yeah. can talk about. But uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, some of them do self implode. They, they put a lot yeah. of pressure on themselves because they do realize as ground officers, a commander is going to look at you and say, airship tells what to do. And, and some of them just, yeah, you know, the pressure gets still. Yeah. Well, you know, your, your voice is heard throughout the, the city, throughout the each police department, you know, that broadcast the, the radio frequency throughout the station. So everybody's always paying attention to what you're saying. And I think, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with that, then it can see it get into you for right. sure. You had brought up the failure rate. What's your guys' failure rate for the, the prospective TFOs in your program? Uh, you know, when I got the seat in 2017, it was 70% washout rate. I, and uh, that wasn't the number I was proud of. I'm like, what are we doing? We're not reinventing the wheel. What are we doing? So I, I did a lot of efforts, um, to do the seminars, uh, to the uh, loan prep classes, to the, the face to face. None of those are required. I just do those to try to help it make it successful. I, I think I brought it to a, a one, one list. I brought it to a, almost a 50% success rate. And then we went right back to 70. And that, I didn't change anything. It just, I think it's the cycle of interest you have at the time. I think it's, uh, uh, I think you could do all that you can. It, it, in the end, it really is up to the officer and those yeah. who are willing to meet the standards will work hard. Uh, and those are the ones you want. The ones who are yeah. going to work hard to meet the standards that you set without lowering the standards, bending the standards. Those who you want will rise up to that occasion. And to be honest, it's such a hard job. 
and there's a lot of officers that are fantastic in the street. They're fantastic investigatively and they get to the position where they're doing the job and it's not for lack of trying. It's just, it's just a hard thing to do. It's seeing things from an airborne perspective sometimes is, is hard for people to grasp and hard to translate into a way that someone else could understand on the ground. So it's just a, it's a difficult thing to do for sure. Yeah. I take no pleasure and it's one of the hardest things I have to do is say it's a no hardest thing. Uh, because you yeah. see the hard work, you see the effort they're putting into it. But uh, in the end, uh, it's the service we're providing to the officers on the ground. It, right. it, it, that's what it comes down to. That That's the only thing that takes the sting away a little bit. But there's no good guy passes. There's no hoping yeah. that they catch on later down the road or they come around. You just can't risk that because, uh, uh, you know, officers' lives are at, at risk. And we could talk about how many backups we've been to. You can talk about how many help calls we've been to. You can talk how many perimeters you set. You'll never, ever capture what you prevented. You'll mm-hmm. never, you'll never capture that traffic stop you flew over that the guy was going to move on the officers and yeah. he decided not to. You'll never capture that guy who's going to do the home invasion in the alley at night and hurt the helicopter and didn't do it. You'll never catch those numbers. It's one of those jobs that uh, you, you have to stick with the standard and, and maintain it. Yeah. When you look at those that are successful, what commonalities or what common traits are you seeing in those that are successful in passing the, the program and becoming you know, successful TFOs and later pilots if they choose? The one common factor, 9 to 11 years. Something about that officer with 9 to 11 years is, is the ones who are going to be successful. Have we had younger officers? Yeah. Have we had uh, the one that the second time go around is 18 years on the job. You know, it's, wow. you know, at first I was like, oh, is this going to try to teach an old dog new tricks? But it wasn't. He, he just had, he just needed, he needed a second time to go around. But that nine to, nine to 11, somewhere around there, it just seems to be that right age, maturity, decision making, judgment, command presence. It just seems all to come together with your, your, their experience from wherever they're coming from. It, yeah. That's the common factor that I see. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's given most folks enough time to have had an opportunity to, to work enough and have enough reps doing different type, types of incidents to where you can now get up in the air and understand how, how to do it successfully from above because you've done it below on the ground mm-hmm. and understand what that looks like. So you know what steps need to be taken to accomplish each job, you know. So I think experience is a huge part of that. I feel that sometimes people forget that patrol is a perishable skill. And I see it when I have a detective or someone from traffic trial for the position. You for, you you have a license plate involved in a crime, but you're not doing anything with that license plate. You had a shooting that just occurred with information that the vehicle, the vehicle fled southbound, but we're still at the scene. Simple things like that. It just, they forget. But if you were in a black and white, that's exactly what you would be doing. License plate, yeah. give me the RO information so I can get a description of that car. Vehicle fled southbound. Hey, partner, let's go southbound and look for this car. That's what you, the guys on patrol in a black and white would do. If you've been out of the game for a little bit, setting the perimeter and send it effectively in a timely manner, we're prioritizing your plan. You haven't done it in a long time. You're going to be resting. You're going to be behind. And while you're trying to figure it out, your suspects work in your orbits and they're out of your perimeter. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, patrol is a perishable uh, skill that I sometimes people forget. And uh, yeah. that's why. Now, me, I got here in seven years. So I'm not in that 9-11. But. I go back to what I was driven. I was driven to go to SWAT. I was driven to go to Metro. I was driven. So I was working a lot. I was working uh, heavy divisions. I was working nights. I was doing a lot. So I think that experience translated over to what they were looking for in a TFO. Now, can a guy from traffic, a guy from detective? Be, yes, we've had those guys successful. They just, you know, somebody else's natural ability is someone else's hard work. And those guys had hard work to do. And they did. And they were successful. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about LAPD broadly. Let's talk about air support, air support division broadly. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about, you know, the number of personnel that you guys have, uh, what mission profiles you support, what, what you fly and, and talk a little bit about your mission equipment? Sure. Well, when we're at TO, we have 25 tactical flight officers and 35 uh, pilots. That's when we're at TO. We have uh, about three to four vacancies right now that we're, we're trying to fill. 80% of our pilots our former tactical flight officers, which means that the other percentage, we have pilots who flew Blackhawks, Apaches, Cobras in the military, fantastic pilots. They just never went through the TFO ranks, so we'll never put them in that situation on the left seat. We have about six civilians and uh, 
I would say about a dozen volunteers um, in their specialty. Like we have a we have a flight surgeon who helps us with our medicals. We have other people who have, who've retired who like to volunteer at static displays and and work our uh, our Angels Foundation things like that. We have about nine supervisors from captain to two three two lieutenants and uh, sergeant twos and, and sergeants. Some of our mission profiles. Uh, well, we fly Astro. Astro. Well, the department loves acronyms, so we had to have an acronym too. So <laughs> Astro stands for Air Support to Regular Operations. Regular operations being patrol. That's our backbone. We do surveillance, high altitude surveillance. We have a formation flight cadre. We do aerial platform tactics, which is, uh, we used to call it sniper training, but someone didn't like the word sniper. So we had to change it to aerial platform shooting. And then someone pointed out, well, if you do APS, that means you're going to go shoot something. No, that's not the case all the time. So then we had to change it to aerial, yeah, air for aerial platform tactics. So you can see where I'm going with there. Right. Um, we have a 412. It's a twin engine bell helicopter, medium lift helicopter. We use to support our specialized unit in tactical insertions. So we have a cadre of pilots and crew chiefs that do that. Instructor pilots. Instructor pilots who perform uh, our 90 day check rides and do our instructions uh, on our uh, entry level pilots. I have a cadre of TFO instructors. And now the reason why I have a cadre of TFO instructors, one, there's a minimum amount of hours as a TFO that you've now made pilot that you have to, uh, you have to have to be a TFO instructor. You also have some kind of instructor training. So you can either have a CFI or I've gone through the department's instructor school. And I have picked these pilots to be TFO instructors because many times you have to fly the aircraft and work the call if mm -hmm. the TFO candidate or trainee is not performing or they're in over their head. So those are very specific and hand selected instructors. We have maintenance pilots. We have a couple of pilots assigned to our Van Nuys maintenance or our GSG general services. General services work on DWP, LAFD and LAPD helicopters, where LAPD helicopters um, need ground runs and uh, test flights. So we have a couple of pilots out there that do that. Uh, we have a cadre of EFT pilots, emergency flight training pilots. Our TFOs are mandated to do uh, emergency flight trainings biannual, and the chief pilot will endorse, I think currently I have six pilots who will take a TFO out if they have that of their CFI, and we'll spend the day with them doing run-all landings and emergency procedures. That's cool. Um, we have a fixed wing cadre. We have a King Air uh, 200, Super 200, um, that we use for transportation from anywhere from pers our own personnel, department personnel, to uh, extradition, to picking up uh, victims or witnesses that need to testify. And then we have the role of the uh, chief TFO and uh, chief pilot. Uh, we have a safety yeah. officer and... Uh, Yes, yeah, so those assignments we have here at Air Support. You're currently the the chief TFO, and you've been that in that position since 2017. I got the position in 2017. Yes, there's a little story behind that. Okay, if, if you, let's if hear you it. Me share. Yeah, I hold the TFO in high regards. I love being a cop. The TFO still allows us to be cops in the helicopter. Pilots, great. Uh, I love being a pilot. Sometimes I'm over an incident where I just want to grab the mic and start directing and doing the, all the cops stuff. But you can't. You have a role, safe operation of the aircraft. The TFO does all that work. So I, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't interested in being a maintenance pilot. I don't want to do ground runs. It's the guys who are there love it. I was interested in being an instructor pilot. But instructor pilots, they don't fly patrol anymore. They, they're busy teaching our pilots to be pilots. So I think I would miss that. TFO and is where you get to be a cop. So my predecessor was on his way out, and I the first person I went to was my wife. I said, I'm considering giving up my pilot wings to take the chief TFO position and uh, and get it to where I think it should be, and then revert back to a pilot. She said, I think you'll miss the flying, but if you want to. And then I asked two other people. One was the assistant commanding officer who I highly respected, who's now retired. He said, I think it's a great idea. We need some experience there. And then the other one was the chief pilot, who I hold, in, uh, hold a lot of respect for. And uh, he said, I think that's a great idea. That position needs some experience. And I think you're the person for the job. 
So I decided to give up my pilot wings and be the chief tier foe because the pilot is represented by the pilots. Or the chief pilot represents the chief, chief TFO, represents the uh, TFOs. Um, so I, I decided to go that route and they let me keep my pilot wings. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> so I, cool. got, I, I got the bullet, best of both worlds. And there's a lot of benefit behind it because uh, when I took my interview, I was asked if I would maintain my currency with my 90 day check rights, uh, my medical and uh, fill in a billet as a pilot if needed. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I am the first pilot who's the chief tactical flight officer. That's awesome. And like it said, was, best of both worlds. Oh yeah. And, it, and the, you know, one, I was concerned of what the fellow TFOs would think about it and they were all accepting, which was, you know, uh, good for me because I wanted their support too. And yeah. now I don't have to rely on a pilot where my predecessor always had to take a pilot to do face checks that he needed done to do any emergency uh, flight training that needed to get done or any uh, required check rights or, or, or TFOs get uh, biannual check rights. He had to seek out a pilot to do that where now I could do it myself. I don't have to yeah, bother the pilot or take a pilot out of rotation or, or their assignment. I can do it myself. So there's a huge benefit on that. I still believe that TFO should be re represented by TFO. But if the division sees a benefit and is accepted among the rank and file of the TFOs that as be a pilot, it, it, there's a lot of benefit in that too. It's, so yeah. anyway, that's how I ended up as the, the chief TFO. I, I hold that position in high regards and I wanted to do it for a while, just temporary, but I'm not looking back on that one either. I, I, yeah. I, I enjoyed the position. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on that. That's Thank huge. You. And, you know, you talk about standards, maintaining the high standard. That's you know, the biggest part of it. You know, you, you can decide how high you can take the program and, and it's obvious that you've made it in a serious effort to, to make the program what it is. So well done there. Thank you. When you were talking about the different assignments, there's, there's two things that stood out to me that I, that I want to unpack. There's a lot there to unpack, but I'll just pick on the two that <laughs> sure. kind of stood out. One was you talked about the, the, the train, the, the TFO trainers. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I think that's a, that's a particular skill that needs to be developed in somebody in order to, to, allow that TFO to properly train somebody. It's, it's a big ask for us to say, Hey, I know you've never had any prop, proper former training on how to train somebody, but I want you to go do this. So the fact that you guys are actually training these people to go and train TFOs, I think is a, is a big deal. Uh, Mike, Mike Calhoun just wrote the book, uh, training through chaos. And it's some, some information and training that comes from kind of the CFI process, you know, and, and, and what that looks like learning how different people learn and, trying to figure out how to apply that to train TFOs. I thought that was great. So the fact that you do that is, is really cool. Has that been that way forever? Or is that something you implemented under your watch? Uh, it's been like that. My predecessor, when we were rewriting our manual in conjunction with the chief pilot, wrote the standards required to be an instructor with a rationale. And the rationale between, so 3,000 hours, you earn your senior TFO wings is the star over the wings. That was a requirement. That was the rationale behind that is that you've had enough experience for 3,000 hours, which would, you know, you're looking at at least five years of TFO and to know the experience of the TFO. And then the uh, CFI or instructor is just the fun fundamentals of instruction. The rationale is that having the, uh, having been taught how to teach, you know, I mean, there was a time when I came through where, uh, and I'm going to pick on Alatori here for a second. Alatori was a very popular instructor and everyone liked to work with him. But what you would hear is, oh, you're Alatori trained. Oh, you're Plahi trained or you're, you're uh, Owens trained. So to me, that said, somebody's doing a different style, a different way. They're all good, but they're different. Me, I didn't want that. I didn't want to hear somebody say, you're Manny trained or you're Dale trained or you're Sean trained we should all be doing the same thing. So when we set these standards, I took the seat once a year or right before a list, I have a TFO instructor training day. We all sit down and I, we go over all the PowerPoints that we teach. We go over the whole instructor rating, um, the, the, uh, the uh, guidelines for uh, rating somebody and we're all on the same board. And this is the time I always tell them too. This is our cadre. We can make it whatever we want. The only difference between you and I is that I get the last word. That's it. Otherwise, I want to hear your input. If you think we're teaching these guys the wrong way, 
I want to hear it. Or if we should teach them a different way, I want to hear it. Out of the, out of the six instructors I have, two of them I consider my primaries. I was a primary for my predecessor and I know how hard that is. That's where you're going to be flying and working calls. For sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's almost like taking a rookie right out of the academy, not to belittle these officers at all because they've earned the right to be here on their loan, but they're unpredictable when you put them in the front seat of a helicopter for the very first time and right. get over pursuit. Some freeze up, some don't know what to say. So as a pilot, you're flying and you're keying the mic or you're telling them what to say verbatim every single step. That's a lot of work for a, for a pilot. So the two that I have are handpicked. My predecessor, Cole Burdett, he had me. And uh, so I, I know how hard it is. So when I, I take a lot in consideration their experience, the maturity, and their attitudes. You know, what we say as instructors carries a lot of weight, especially for yeah. the ones coming inside and, and say that they're unsuccessful. They leave. Now they're ambassadors to us, whether it be good or bad. They go back right. to the division and they can say, those guys at air sports are a bunch of prima donna pricks. Or they can say, that's the hardest job I've ever done. I have yeah. more respect for that position now than I ever had before. I'm going right. to work a little bit better with them. So, and I like to think the latter is the, uh, is the, uh, most common, you know, result is when they, they do leave. And I do get that feedback. You know, uh, I'll get a new candidate and say, oh, I, I worked with, I worked with Jones at, uh, 77th. And, he, he tried out for and he told me, wow, he goes, it, it was tough and he yeah. has a lot of respect for you guys. So we, we do hear it come back to us quite a bit, but, um, I don't know how I got on. Oh yeah. Picking out the instructors. Yeah. One more thing I want to touch on was you talked about the formation flight cadre. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously one of the sad parts of, of any public safety aviation or public safety job is the funerals and different things that we have to attend. One of the biggest honors, I think that, that, uh, exists at those memorials is the, the flyover, the missing man formations. Uh, one thing you guys do that I really like that, that I hope my agency implements, I think Alatory is working to this end and um, other agencies, you know, worldwide really is your formation flight cadre. I like that you guys, and we looked at your, how you do it, which is great. You guys, the, the people that are flying in formation at these different events, you all attend the same training and you all, have flown together in these for formation flights before. So, you know, or you can expect what that person in front of you or behind you is going to do. I mm -hmm. think, um, a lot of times these agencies, they, they put people in these formation flights. who have never flown formation flights together. And some agencies have never trained at all on what a formation flight should look like, or some of the risks that are involved in these formation flights. So I, I think it's really important, you know, to establish some guidelines as it pertains to these things, because the last thing you want to do is have an incident over, over a memorial that's our people are already mourning the loss of someone else. Just worst case scenario to me. Yeah, I uh, I'm part of the uh, formation flight cadre, and I do take the we call it the AMC, the Air Mission Commander. I take the lead on that quite a bit because, and I don't get to fl the AMC doesn't get to fly; it, they get to organize it, and I love organizing it because I love. I'm honored to conduct the last act for a fallen hero. That's how I see it. And the timing, the people you're using in the formation who are all part of the cadre because they went through the training, a lot of trust. I do, I will admit, I do pick my chalk one <laughs> by name sometimes. Uh, you will pick my chalk two and three by name sometimes and also the, uh, the chalk four, uh, uh, AMC is usually in the chalk four. But we do, our per our manual, we do have four tactical flight officers who are assigned the cadre to either sit left seat. So as TFOs, they learn what the sight picture is supposed to be, help with the distance, and watch the gauges, how watch the gauges for the, uh, the pilots. Uh, but their main role is ground. <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's one of the hardest job is trying to get the timing to have you call you in. And, uh, and no one wants to be late <laughs> and no one wants to be early you want it to be perfect and uh, uh it's a good cadre it's uh it's again it's uh can't say it enough it's honored to do the last act for a fallen hero during their services yeah, mm -hmm. yeah really cool i uh, love that you guys do that like i said the last act that you could perform for a phone officer firefighter whatever whoever it is we're doing it for it, it, what an honor to do that so mm -hmm. really cool that that you guys have the ability to, to train specifically for that. And again, I think that's something that, that everybody should, should have the time to do if you're going to participate in those types of, of events. 
So, you know, LA, I, I want to talk about airspace real quick if you have time. I think everybody understands flying in the LA basin, how busy the LA basin is, and not even specifically around where you guys operate out of, but just the LA basin in general. You've got the class Bravo airspace. There's multiple deltas in, in the area. Uh, there's a few Charlies in the northern part of the county. Can you talk about the complexities sure. pertaining to the airspace you operate in? Okay, well, let's start with the Class Bravo. The uh, planes are on final right over South Central, uh, our busiest division, 77, Southeast, New Division, Southwest. We have a letter of agreement with LA where once we cross the 10 freeway southbound, even though we're not in their airspace, but that's kind of like the uh, letter of agreement, we check in with them. And as you know, Class Bravo is not one to loiter in for your general aviation or news media, it's a transition. So uh, when we check in, the understanding is we're checking in because we're on patrol. And the understanding is that we're going to be 900 feet or below is how we check in. There's two parts of that area. The other part is going to be called the critical area where they want us to be 500 feet or below, which that's a sea level, which above ground level puts about 300 and change. We don't like working in the critical area because we're really yeah. low. And they don't like us there because they have heavies right above us. And they have, we have to acknowledge we see them and they have to, uh, we have to acknowledge the possible wake turbulence. So it's just constant radio chatter when we're in the critical area. And the uh, air, other area we call area one, um, it's just 900 below on patrol. They don't have to point out every single piece of traffic to us. So that can be pretty busy when it comes to pursuit. LA works really well with us, especially if I have a help call or backup. I will literally tell them, uh, we cross the critical area. I have a police emergency and they will work with us. Uh, I've had a number of pursuits southbound the 405 freeway or the 110 freeway where they would allow me through, but they would hold media and they wouldn't let them through. Or they would slow up traffic for me to, uh, to get through. Pretty amazing how they work with us. And when it's all over, I know I'm talking to some civilian in a tower. I like to let them know, thanks for the help. We have one bad guy in custody. And I yeah. know, and I'm hoping he went home and said, kids, guess what I did today? I helped yeah. the police catch this bad guy that you saw on the news. I was part of that. So we do like to uh, acknowledge him. Um, we have a uh, class Bravo or a class, uh, Charlie, uh, Burbank airspace. Um, the challenge with that one is cross runways. So we request quadrants to work in and same thing goes there. If you have a backup, a pursuit, a police emergency you need to get to whether it be what quadrant you're working in, you have to ask permission each time. You can have, a, it's called runway eight on Burbank, which is their primary runway, which, you know, quadrant on the uh, north or south west quadrant is where our common patrol area is. We have to constantly request to cross over the extended runway of eight all the time. So that's a big challenge. Now, class Delta, we have Whiteman, we have uh, Van Nuys, uh, Hawthorne, Santa Monica, uh, Torrance, they're as busy as any Delta, but the challenges that come with that is <coughs> Van Nuys is the busiest municipal airport in the world. And that has a lot to do with the rich and famous here. So they are very busy. They don't like repeats. And if you make a call, you repeat it and you're on your way. So that's a very busy airport. White men shares the same airspace with Van Nuys and uh, Burbank. So you can imagine how you got to be really quick with your frequency changes and, you know, be clear and concise with your broadcasting and no repeats. The the other challenge is uh, the uncontrolled airspace. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of that in, in downtown L.A. where we're dealing with your general aviation traffic. Uh, your, you know, we're the capital for media helicopters in this area. Uh, we have fire that we talked about. We have tour helicopters, which is heavy out of Santa Monica and Torrance, um, up and down Hollywood Hills and uh, the beach. And then we have charter aircraft, which is not as busy, but they're out there. And those are the ones who are like Children's Hospital um, mm -hmm. uh, helicopters or the rich and famous charter uh, helicopters. So not only do we have challenges with the control airspace, Oh, the uncontrolled airspace as well. Very busy. Yeah, I know f flying out there in the uncontrolled airspace, it takes the pilot and the TFO, you know, all hands on deck, paying attention to TCAS to out the window for all the all the traffic in the area. It is it is it's heavy, like you said. Yeah, and 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 we, I like to think we do a pretty good job with the training of the TFOs. We teach them when when I was when I first got here, 
I wasn't taught to look for traffic or, or know what, uh, you know, you just did your job. You don't tell the pilot how to fly where the culture has changed now where our TFOs go through a safety management system with our safety officer and um, they're taught to, to speak up and point things out. And, you know, it just gets irritating when they point something out that's 20 miles away. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I see that. That guy's okay. No, but they catch on pretty quick. Yeah, I, th- I think that's been one of the, the neatest culture shifts since I've been there as well. I think there used to be a dividing line down the middle of the cockpit. I do this side, you do that oh, yeah. side. Now it mm-hmm. seems like the, the line is blurred and we're helping each other do the job. And that's especially when it comes to aircraft safety. That's huge. Well, we've come a, we've come a long way from Jaffel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, there's two things I want to talk about. One is you talk about the the, tr- the uncontrolled airspace. I actually, it's not uncontrolled. That transition underneath the LAX departures on that coastline transition, that is one of the coolest flights that I've ever done. It's yeah. so cool. You're know, 150 feet or below, and you've got these departures coming off the top of you, and you can see all the beachgoers below you. You can like yeah. ex- read the expressions in their face. It's so close. <laughs> That's one of the coolest things I've ever done. How neat that you guys get to operate there every day. The other was in, in reference to the controllers and, and the relationship that you guys have with them and the trust they have in you guys to do exactly what they're asking you to do. I know that doesn't happen by accident. Those relationships are fostered over time. And you guys do something that's really cool to help foster those relationships. And it's not just yes, for your agency. Do. It's 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 for the controllers, you know, region wide. And we'll just touch on it real quick. It's the it's not the LAPD ch- the chili flying anymore. It's now it's the what what's the new disaster <laughs> you know what? Paradise I event still, or something? I still have to it's the public safety aviation disaster preparedness exercise. <laughs> okay. I still have to, I still have to read it because I forget it. Was, but do you know the story behind how we had to change the name? Uh, just vaguely. Okay. Well, do you, you know what it's all about though? It's yeah. If, mm-hmm. if you want me to share that, I don't know if. You yeah, know. please. Okay. Yeah. So as a thank you for, um, an acknowledgement for all the, uh, partnership we work day in and day out with the towers, we would fly them in for almost like an open house to come to get some FaceTime with them, talk about how we're doing and what we could do better and get their terminology and what they would want from us. They get a little tour of our facility and a bowl of chili and, you know, and whatever swag we might have, you know, t-shirts, coins and things like that. It's gotten bigger and bigger each year to not only are we picking up tower people, Military's flying in, fire, county, other agencies. It's a huge flying. I did get questioned by a certain newspaper of how much money we're spending to go pick people up to serve them a bowl of chili. So we had to change it to that name. And because it's such, it makes sense. If anything were to happen in downtown LA, unusual occurrence, uh, disaster of some sort, our largest heliport in the world, Hooper, would be the hub for the exercise of getting uh, resources, supplies, personnel in and out in a timely manner. So we have key people who work our tower, key people who work the flight deck, uh, and key people who do the uh, uh, coordinating of all that. And it is an exercise, it turns into an exercise, but the spirit of it is to pick up those tower people and say, thank you. Thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for working with us. And, uh, please enjoy your, your day. And they get a kick out of it. For a lot of them, it's their very first time in the helicopter. Uh, I don't think any of them are local. They all come from different parts of the, uh, the nation. And it, they look forward every year to it, which is scheduled, uh, November 2nd this year. And you can always tell when they know it's coming because their tone on the uh, frequency is a little bit nicer <laughs> than as the closer we get to the date. <laughs> they want to get invited. But, yeah. But so we, uh, we, we, it's a max deployment and uh, we have a, a shuttle crew that go up, but we need help because there are so many of them that those big helicopters that are coming in, like fire department, sheriffs, we ask them to pick up some tower people on the way. So they, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a group effort. And yeah, it worked out really good for us. We would pick up uh, tower personnel from Ontario and fly them in. Okay. And it's great for our relationships because, you know, you put a face to the name and you get to know mm-hmm. these folks going back and forth. And they're they're excited, like you said, one, for the flight, but two, to go out to your facility and, and see it because it is really impressive. And then the the benefit for us as well was when we were planning our, our fly-in, our, our annual safety fly-in, we came out and helped you guys 
at your facility for the for your for the um, call it chili flying because that's what I you know want to keep saying. That. I still but have for to your, look at that thing. To- <laughs> <laughs> for your for your event, and uh, we were able to take what we learned at, at your facility and apply it to what we were doing. So, you know what you guys are doing there. What's what operationally is is spreading throughout the region. So, ho- hopefully, if there's a natural disaster or something like you're saying happens to where we have to enact these plans that have been put in place through this, this event, it can happen. And it's not just LAPD that can do it. It's these different air, different uh, aviation units throughout the region. So that's really cool. You guys are having that influence, you know, outside of your department and outside of the LA County area. That's, that's, that's huge. So yeah, I highly encourage anybody who has the chance to, to go to the disaster preparedness event to, to, to make it out there because it is, it is really cool. The last thing I want to touch on is you talked about swag a little bit, your angels, angels foundation. You guys have done an amazing job of, of developing angels foundation. So just a little plug for them, if you could on, on what they do for you guys and how people can get their hands on some LAPD aviation swag. Just like any, uh, any division, there's a, there's a store where you could buy things and, and the money usually uh, goes towards the uh, the station fund, which is to enhance it for whatever reasons. But, uh, you know, there's laws when it comes to making money and making a profit. So uh, what one of our volunteers, Lance Orden, has done is, uh, I don't know what the code is for it, but uh, he, he he made it legit, an Angels Foundation, which uh, where it takes, uh, we, we raise money, uh, people can donate, and we use the funds to enhance the the equipment uh supplies whatever's needed it also helps us spread you know the uh the whatever we have it whether it be challenge coins t-shirts hats to people who visit us and and want to take some home with them all that can be done online too so so we had a similar program, although it wasn't a 501c3. We hadn't gotten to that point yet. So we studied what you guys did to, to look for how to do that nonprofit, get that nonprofit status. Because like you said, there are rules that surround how you yeah. collect money and, and, and how it's divvied up. But it's huge when it comes to supplying money for retirement parties, retirement gifts, annual holiday pr- gifts and presents, and or not presents, but uh, parties. Uh, things that city funding won't pay for those funds exactly. step in to do. And, and it's huge that you guys do that. So if you come in for the LAPD chili flying or, or the, uh, the crew school air crew school, um, I believe they're set up there as well. You can, you can go to their yes. booth, yes. find their swag or buy it mm-hmm. online. I'll put a, I'll put a link to the, uh, angels foundation in the episode description and at the beginning of the, the episode. So man, it was really cool to, to talk to you. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to spread the good word about what you guys are doing and all the programs you guys have in place. Thank you for your impact regionally. Like I said, you guys are, uh, you're doing really big things outside of your program. And the fact that you guys are willing to, you know, spread the the knowledge. I think anytime anybody ever has a question, the first response, like, Hey, let's call APD. Like you guys, you guys have crossed this bridge at some point. So thank you for that. Yeah. Real quick before I, before we walk out, we skip this part and this is always one of the favorite parts of the, of the conversation. There's always two things that I think are interesting. One, uh, as a police officer and in, in public safety aviation, we see the funniest things. We have a front row seat, the greatest show on earth. I say that a lot. But beyond that, we're a part of a lot of impactful uh, operations and a lot of impactful um, incidents. Is there anything that, that comes to mind when you bring up the idea of being a part of one of those incidents? Yes. Uh, one of the most memorable times here at airsport my wife would want me to say is i met her here that's yeah. that's probably the one she would want to yeah. hear because uh, she was here when i got here and we met and i uh, got married and had have our family but uh one of the most memorable ones that sticks into my head i got here in uh may of 2000 and this incident occurred in november of 2000 the same year so i'm a very new young tfo and i'm still learning and it was my first time seeing an officer bleeding out and that impacted me a lot. It was a U.S. Marshals serving a uh, warrant on a suspect in Marina Del Rey over in our, our Pacific Division. And the suspect shot through the door, striking one of the marshals who went down. Um, a help call was generated. They didn't have our radio, so it was a 911 call. Uh, unknown officer requesting help. Officer shot. Um, our first unit that responded 
park right in front of the apartment complex. I th- can't believe, I can't remember if it's the second or third floor, but the suspect's balcony faced the front of the apartment complex. And when the officers exit, he took shots of them and hit striking the driver officer who went down immediately and was using the black and white as protection from the gunman who kept firing at him. Another help call comes out and here we come in. So my first orbit and the image I had was seeing a blue suit. I couldn't even tell you the race of the officer. All I saw was a blue suit officer with blood all over the, the concrete of the black and white. And I knew he was alive and still moving. And when we talk about TFO standards, that's where you have to go to work. That's where you have to start performing. Uh, I had multiple agencies. Uh, I had multiple units responding. I needed a command presence. I needed to communicate. I needed to get to work. So, uh, the, the street was like a, a turnaround in front of the apartment complex. So it wasn't like you could come in any direction. So all the officers were stacked up on the east side of the building out of the range of the balcony and the officers screaming for help, but they can't get to them because then they would be in a, a fire. Tunnel vision setting in and I remember going back to my patrol training, the, the training that the department sends us to, officer rescue. I broadcast, hey guys, we need to start putting vests on the black and white and do what we do, uh, an officer rescue. So proud of watching these officers taking off their vests, throwing vests on the windshield, the, the hoods of the car. They went in and it was like a training day. They ran in, um, opened the door, they scooted this officer in and took off and uh, they were gone with them. From there, I can focus on everything else, send the perimeter, send the command post, uh, directing resources in. We still had the problem with the marshal still stuck in the apartment complex, but we were able to find a back door and get him rescued. Uh, but that was what five, six months of being a TFO. And when I talked about one radio call being away from a North Hollywood shooting, shooting or a school shooting or a terrorist attack, those days are going to happen. And it doesn't matter if you've been here for 23 years like myself or your first radio call. The standards are set for a reason and the expectation for the TFO to perform. Uh, are there and, and they have to perform. And that's why we don't change the standards that we set or bend them or hope that they come along. We, we, we expect the ones that work hard rise up to those standards and those are the ones we want. So that was, yeah. that was, that was, that was the most memorable one for me. That's awesome. I mean, that illustrates the effect that we as an air crew have you know, on the outcome of an incident. You know, had it not been for you and, and your presence of mind to consider that, uh, that officer could have well bled out on the scene and not have had the opportunity to been rescued in a timely manner. And so, yeah, it just goes to show, like you said, we're one radio call away from an incident like that. And an incident where like you, like you showed, we have uh, so much ability to get in there and make an impactful difference on the outcome of something. But well done, you know, in that incident and, and man, looking at the totality of, of everything you've done throughout your career, whether it was on a street and patrol or investigatively and now in aviation, as the chief TFO, it's no doubt that you've impacted everyone around you in every single position you've worked in, in in a positive way. You know, a lot of people uh, make an impact, but may not be in a positive way. And I can see, you know, the positive impact you've had on on the folks around you and and again, regionally. So thank you for your dedication to to the industry and and our profession. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and, I uh, look forward to to seeing you at, at uh, some of the events that are coming up. And uh, and hopefully one of these days we get together and it's not a, a coffee and a water. It's a, it's a beer <laughs> and a, a whiskey or something Deal. like that. <laughs> <Deal>. <laughs> so uh, until then, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll say cheers and, and uh, catch you next time. Okay. Thank you, John.